Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to cover the second half of the batons issue, and that's electrical or stun batons. But first, I'd like to address a couple of questions that I've got from the previous video. So first, people said, you said you can't get a license to possess a prohibited baton. So what is it that security guards are getting when they get a baton license? And that's a good question. They're not actually getting a license to possess a prohibited baton. What they're getting is a license to carry a baton while they're engaged in security details and security duties. So ordinarily, in a lot of provinces, the province itself, so not the criminal legislation, but the province themselves, uh, regulate what security guards are allowed to carry around and use in the course of their duties. Now, the province doesn't give them permission to use a prohibited baton, but as we saw from the last video, the sphere of prohibited batons is actually fairly narrow. Most batons are simply weapons, but not prohibited weapons. And so far as I know, no province is licensing or purporting to license people to carry a Kyoga baton which would, or a Steel Cobra, which would be a prohibited weapon. And if they tried to do so, they'd probably be running afoul of constitutional issues because the province can't trump the, uh, the federal government in that fashion. So that's sort of the what's going on there is that you're actually getting a license to carry a baton which is not prohibited. The other question somebody asked, and this was a very good catch, I give them props for this one, which is they said, wait a minute, what if you're running a company that provides uh, weapons to the movie industry? Can't they get a business license that would allow them to possess these implements? And that's absolutely right. That is actually a situation where you could potentially have a license that allows you to possess a prohibited uh, baton of whatever style. So good catch there, but in terms of a individual personal person carrying it around for purposes of defense or anything like that, they're not issuing licenses for that. Now, when we start talking about batons in terms of electrical batons, let's start with looking at the, uh, the prohibited weapons order that applies. And that notes here, any device that is designed to be capable of injuring, immobilizing, or incapacitating a person or animal uh, by discharging an electrical charge produced by means of the amplification or accumulation of the electrical current generated by a battery where the device is designed or altered so that the electrical charge may be discharged when the device is of a length of less than 480 millimeters and any similar device. It's quite a mouthful. I'm not sure why they specified all the technical details here because really what they're trying to get to is a thing you can shock people or animals with. You might be wondering, wait a minute, why did they specify 480 millimeters? That seems like a bit of an odd thing to specify. And the reason for that is that they actually wanted to make sure that cattle prods were not banned by this section. So a cattle prod is still fine so long as it's over 480 millimeters. The question then comes up is, wait a minute, what happens if I have a stun gun and it's just a really long stun gun? Is that okay? And the answer is yes. So long as it's uh, over 480 millimeters, it is not a prohibited weapon. Now, let's stop and think about that a little bit because even though it's not a prohibited weapon, it's still a weapon. We'll talk a little bit about the law here as it applies to these things, and then I'll come back to the details about it being a weapon and it being a somewhat obvious weapon and what that means in terms of practical implications if you want to own one of these things and do anything with it. So the first thing I want to look at here is the case of, sorry, I'll just scroll up. It is the case of the Queen and Himanon and several other people. But this is an interesting case. Most of it I'm going to not read to you because most of it is legally boring and you don't need to know that. The key bit here is this little bit which starts at paragraph 22. The criminal code contains certain regulations which set out devices that are prescribed uh, to be prohibited weapons in statutory regulations. Uh, these were previous orders that have now been consolidated by regulation and the constable refers us to two of these regulations. In part three of those regulations, paragraph six, he describes any device that is designed to be capable of injuring and mobilizing. Well, we just went over that. I'll skip it. I'm going to pause there and say that the evidence certainly satisfies me. And I do not think there's any argument that the device we have marked as exhibit three does discharge an electrical charge as described in the regulation. And it is certainly capable of injuring. And the best evidence we have is of course, 
Constable Quelia, who uses himself as a test subject. This is kind of neat, right? Because what we have here is that the officer actually took the device that was seized and zapped himself. You might be thinking, wait a minute, isn't that odd? And believe it or not, this is something that happens. It's a, Sometimes you'll see this with pepper spray too. You know, an officer goes out and says, I sprayed this and, you know, I got a little bit of it in my eyes and it was certainly pepper spray. And so that's how we know that it's pepper spray and, you know, triggered or triggers certain other laws. In this case, he zaps himself. Interesting. Well, if you're wondering why he might do this, I'm just going to look at another case really briefly here. And this one is the case of the Queen and Crocar. And this shows the other way that they might prove this same issue. And so this has Charles Martin, forensic scientist. Charles Martin was called by the Crown as an expert witness, employed as a forensic scientist with the Center of Forensic Sciences. He was qualified to provide opinion evidence in the area of the examination and testing of conductive energy devices and whether such devices are capable of inflicting pain on humans or animals. The cell phone slash taser located in the defendant's vehicle was examined by him and he produced a report dated January 13th, 2011, which was filed as Exhibit 26 at trial. He was existed in, or assisted in his examination by a technologist, Dennis Hopper. The cell phone-like device, which was described as a Keylon model K95, was physically measured and its longest length was found to be 115.78 millimeters as measured on the diagonal. And the reason why they're measuring it is again, that 480 millimeter issue. So this is well below that. It was powered by an internally rechargeable battery. On testing, an electrical output uh, was observed at the two contacts at the end of the device. An electrical arc appeared between the two contacts, which appears like a small lightning bolt. A switch is activated to do this on the device. Once it was determined that the device was functional, it was attached to a test apparatus. 10 tests of the instrument were conducted and the data were recorded electronically and later processed by software to explain the results. The average peak voltage that was measured was 5,037 volts. The power output was measured to be 5.99 watts and the average peak current was calculated to be 8.6 amperes. He was able to determine that the average charge per pulse was 17.6 microcoulombs uh, per each pulse. I am not an electrician, I'm not a scientist, so they're giving us a whole bunch of details here, but that's why they've got an expert witness here. Charles Martin testified that he made reference to the research of J. Patrick Riley, who has studied pain thresholds in human beings. J. Patrick Riley determined that the pain threshold for his average adult test subject when contacted the forearm was 0.5 microcoulombs. The average pulse from the instrument tested was therefore roughly 35 times greater than the pain threshold for adult human beings. So here they've used an expert, they've hooked it up to a machine, they've done all this measurement. The reason why they might want to avoid that is A, it's a lot easier to be sure that your officer is going to show than to go through all of this hassle. And B, bringing in a forensic scientist is actually fairly expensive. I will tell you that in a lot of small trials, the for, if there's a an expert witness who's got sort of any qualifications, they may well be earning more than either lawyer who's actually present, you know, arguing things. And that's because they're people with useful skills who have better sense than to go into a courtroom unless they're being paid large amounts of money. So the Crown maybe doesn't want to spend that. And so it's a lot easier if the officer's willing to just give himself a zap. That's neither here nor there, but it's kind of an interesting aspect of this case is that that's what the officer does because it leads to our next argument, which is why this case is interesting. Mr. Dirksen suggests though, that it does not meet the definition of a weapon under that because there is the added requirement that the device be designed or altered such that the electrical charge may be discharged when the device is of a length less than 480 millimeters. And in this case, certainly the report suggests that in fact, the current is discharged when the device is longer than 480 millimeters. Again, I've gone over the report and I do not see the contradiction. The report is essentially silent on that point, but Constable Quayley's evidence is quite clear. During the break, I had the opportunity to listen on the DARS system to his answer. And again, in cross-examination, he was clear on this point. The current can run either expanded or compressed. And so although he did not test the item on himself in a compressed state, he was clear that while the device was less than 480 millimeters, it was capable of discharging the electrical current that would in turn be capable of causing injury. 
to explain all of this a little bit and put it into maybe less judicial terms, this is a baton that is an expandable baton. It has an expanded state and a compressed state. And this one can discharge the current in both the long form and the short form. Now, Constable Qualia apparently tested this on himself only when it was in the extended state. And so defense here is trying to argue that because he never tested it on himself when it was reduced, that we can't know that it can cause injury in that state. The court's not having it. The court is like, mm, no, it clearly still discharged a shock. You know, it appears that the officer tested it just to see that it could make the spark while it was in its small form. And so the, the judge is willing to say, listen, I'm convinced here that the spark is likely the same. Now, this isn't actually a bad argument. I think I would have made the same argument. I might not have been like, you know, this isn't a situation where you're absolutely certain that it's going to carry the day. But how do we know that it's going to have the same level of current when it's compressed as it does when it's expanded? I don't know the internal design of this thing. I don't know how it's built. I don't know any of that stuff. It's not a bad argument to make, but it didn't work here. So that's uh, that's what they're stuck with. But what that tells us is that when we're looking at this and it tells us that the electrical charge may be discharged when the device is of a length less than 480 millimeters, if you're dealing with an item that can, you know, that is expandable or contractible, you have to see where that can be discharged. So you'd want to be sure that if it's something that can change in size, that it can't spark when it's smaller than 480 millimeters. And keep in mind, that's a hard limit. So you want to be really careful about your measurements because if it turns out to be 479 millimeters, you're in a lot of trouble, but 481 millimeters, you're good. That's a bit of a problem there. Now, normally when people are asking me about this, they have a more pragmatic question in mind than can I simply own this? They're not wanting to buy one and put it on a shelf. They're not wanting to put it up on the wall as a display item or just show their friends. They're asking, if I buy this, can I carry it around? Can I go for a late night walk and bring my stun cane in case I run into a mugger or worse? And this is not a good idea. I mean, they sell these items and they are not prohibited weapons, but they are clearly weapons. And so the risk you're facing there is that you will be charged with possession of weapon for purposes of danger to the public peace. Normally the Crown has two major obstacles to overcome. Uh, possession is often not a big issue if they're finding something on you, but they have to prove that it's a weapon. And so lots of these cases are lost on the basis that the Crown can't prove that the item is a weapon. This, These items, on the other hand, when you're talking about a stun cane or a stun baton, the Crown's going to have a real easy time with that. The court's not going to take a whole lot of time in finding that your, you know, your thing that goes sparky to zap somebody is a weapon. They're going to say, yeah, that's clearly a weapon. And so that's half the Crown's case right there, done. The other aspect is the purpose is dangerous to the public peace. And unfortunately, Canadian law says that carrying a weapon for the purpose of defending yourself against sort of the ordinary dangers of the universe is a purpose dangerous to the public peace. I don't necessarily, I don't, well, I, it's not necessarily. I don't like this. I don't think it's a good sort of ruling. I don't think it's, but it's well enshrined in Canadian law, unfortunately. So that's what you're stuck with. You can't just carry around an item for the purposes of defending yourself against sort of unanticipated unknown threats. There may be certain circumstances where you can carry a weapon for self-defense, but they're fairly narrow. And unfortunately, the case law is not terribly clear on that. I'll cover the case of the Queen and Care sometime, which can show you just how messy things can get. But this makes it that you're facing a real strong likelihood that if you're carrying around one of these things, it may be observed and recognized by a police officer, and now you're facing charges. There's more police officers on the street on at, at any given time, and almost certainly more police officers in the places you want to go for a walk at any given time than there are muggers. So your risk is greater now from the police, because if the police stop you and charge you with this, 
you're going to end up losing more money from this than you would have lost to a mugger. Now, admittedly, there are worse dangers in the universe than muggers, but when you think about it, a mugger can take the contents of your wallet, but if you're charged with an offense, uh, first, if you're convicted, the fines are likely to be substantially more than you get out of your wallet, or if you end up doing jail time, you're going to lose a lot more than that in terms of lost work. And hiring a lawyer, if your lawyer pulls up to the courthouse in a BMW, you're the guy paying for that BMW. You're the guy making his car payment. So, you know, you got to think about that uh, cost benefit. In terms of, you know, the worst dangers in the universe than muggers, and I'm not going to sort of venture any guesses here because YouTube would probably uh, not be happy with that. But these are also not great weapons. And the reason why I say that is that police officers are not in the habit of carrying stun guns. They have tasers, and the tasers have a backup drive stun feature. But this is a backup for if the darts don't work and you need to have something weapony in your hand at that moment. This is better than nothing. But these electrical stun guns function by pain compliance, which means they hurt real bad, and that's supposed to discourage somebody from doing what they're doing. Pain compliance is at its least effective when you're talking about people who are motivated because they want something real bad. They might something, want something real bad enough that they're willing to get hurt over it. Or when they're angry, you know, strong emotional states can overcome those issues. If they're full of adrenaline because they're in a fight, they can potentially overcome that. You're going to feel pain less if you are, you know, in an adrenal state. If they are also in altered states of consciousness, because perhaps they've consumed drugs, or people overrate the dangerousness of the mentally ill. However, on occasion, mentally ill people do engage in violence, and again, may be less subject to pain compliance. So if you're going to carry something that is an obvious weapon, these are one of the worst possible choices. Don't buy one, and certainly don't carry weapons around because the likely outcome of that is that you face charges, and I really hate sort of dealing with ordinary, sort of honest, you know, average people who have found themselves in, you know, in trouble with the law because of some screw-up. That's not really where I'd like to see anybody. Unfortunately, that's just the state of our law. You can't really carry around weapons for those purposes including, you know, weapons that are legal to own. So at any rate, I hope this has provided a useful explanation for the legalities around these particular items. If you found this content to be useful or interesting, please like the video, share it with your friends, hit the subscribe button. I want to give a thank you to $50 supporter George, $30 supporter Steve Browning, as well as to my $10 supporters who will be following in the crawl immediately after this. I've got a link to the case law I've mentioned in the description, as well as to my Patreon. Thank you once again, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge. Mm -hmm.